are all still reeling from this really terrible, terrible tragedy. And I mean, there's no words to describe it. Tragedy is not enough. We never thought that something like this could happen. You know, it's already been called the worst day in Jewish history since the Holocaust, the most deadliest day since the Holocaust, one of the most one of the most fatal days in all of Jewish history, not even just in the in recent history, but in all of Jewish history. And, uh, you know, people have been calling it Israel's 9-11. So it's, it's just an unspeakable, unspeakable tragedy. I don't think any of us can understand how this is even possible. How is it that the most, one of the most heavily defended countries in the world, with one of the best militaries in the world, somehow lets a bunch of animals on motorcycles just walk right through you know, and, and abduct families and, and little children. And we've, we've seen the, the, I'm sure we've all seen people sharing videos on social media. It's just, uh, it's better not to watch these things. So the, the, the things that these so-called people are doing, uh, just terrible. What do we make of it? How do we, how do we try to at least understand it? And what can we do to help the situation? That's right. Not even animals would behave like this. Calling them animals would be an insult to animals. That's, that's quite correct. You know, uh, we, we're all, we, we all recognize that we're in the time that our sages call the Kvota Mashiach, the footsteps of the Messiah. That we, we await Mashiach, we await the final redemption and uh, the, the final era of world peace. And this period is called the footsteps of the Messiah. It's also often called Hevle Mashiach, the birth pangs of the Messiah. You know, like uh, a woman in childbirth, like contractions, we, we feel the pain. And before that final, the birth of that final redemption, there's this terrible pain, these birth pangs. And in Sanhedrin, Chazal say, Amal Ula, one of the great sages of the Talmud, Ula said, let him come, but let me not see him. You know, let Mashiach come, but let me not see him. V'chein amar Rabba, and Rabba also said, Yate velo echimne, let, let him come, and let me not see him. You know, it's going to be such a terrible time. There's going to be such catastrophes that they, Ula and Rabba and others, they didn't even want to be, they, they'd rather not be alive during that time. That's how horrible they envisioned, they saw in the future times, in the end of days, it's going to be so terrible that we'd rather not be alive when this happens. Let him come and let me not see him. You know, and, and, the, and elsewhere, the Talmud says people will lose all hope and it'll be so terrible that they will know that there's none to rely upon. Ain al milayshan, except there's none to rely, Ella avinu except our Father in heaven. And the fact that it happened when it happened it's not a coincidence, of course, that it happened right at the end of Sukkot on Shemini Atzeret. Because, as you know, on, over Sukkot, we actually read many of the, several of the Aftarot on the holiday of Sukkot has to do with the coming of Mashiach and with the final war, with the final kind of apocalyptic war at the end of days, which is often called Gogu Magog. And one of the Aftarot that we read on Sukkot is from, right from Yechezkel, which speaks about Gogu Magog, and another is from Zechariah. Uh, that speaks about what happens, what will happen at the end of days and the final war. So Sukkot has always been associated with the final war. And there is a tradition that that final war will begin on Sukkot. More specifically, on Hoshana Rabba, or right after Hoshana Rabba, which is the last day of Sukkot. Hoshana Rabba means the great salvation, and it's the last day of Sukkot. So there was always this tradition that the final war would begin right at the end of Sukkot. So it's probably not a coincidence that this happened when it did. And specifically, who will start that war? Our sages tell us who will start that war. From the Zohar, for instance, says, Uvnei Ishmael zminin ba'uzimna, in that time, in the end of days, the Bnei Ishmael, the Ishmaelites, you know, the whole Muslim world. What will they do at that time? They will come and wage a war against Jerusalem against Israel, Dichtiv, like we read in Zechariah chapter 14, that God said he will bring the nations to Jerusalem, to Israel to fight. And it says in Tehilim, 
In the second chapter, Itiatsu Malchei Aretz Veroznim Nosdo Yachad Al Hashem Ve'al Meshicho, that the nations of the world will come together and attack, go against Hashem, and go against Mashiach, and go against Israel. And so this was already prophesied long ago, that the final war at the end of days, the final Gog and Magog conflict will be instigated by, although it, it will involve many nations, it'll be instigated by the Ishmaelim. And which of the Ishmaelim, who, which among in the whole world of Ishmaelim and the whole Muslim world, who will it be specifically? And the Midrash explains this in, in many places. Again, one of them is in Yelkut Shimoni, one of the famous Midrashim, one of the most important ones, uh, on Ishayahu, on Isaiah chapter 60, which describes, again, the Messianic age. So in Yelkut Shimoni part 2, chapter 499, and I'll come back to this later, it's, it's a very long passage, and it goes in, in detail about exactly what's going to happen and the sequence of events and what will happen with Mashiach. So if you're interested, you can read that in, in more depth. It's Yelkut Shimoni, chapter 499, on the 60th chapter of Isaiah. And what it says there is, Shana Shemelech HaMashiach Niglabo, the year that Mashiach will come. So there's going to be all the different nations of the world are going to be in conflict with each other. And then, there's going to be a conflict between Persia, Paras, Iran, and Melech Arabi, and Arabia. And the Arabian king will go to Aram to get advice. And what's going to happen after this, when the Arabian king is going to try to make some kind of deal? The Persians, the Iranians, Paras will start a war that will destroy the whole world. That's what it says. And when you think about what we've seen in the last couple of weeks, all over the news we've been seeing how Saudi Arabia, this rapprochement between Israel and Saudi Arabia, they're working on a peace deal, the U.S., and Israel and Saudi Arabia are so close to finally to finalizing this peace agreement. And of course, Iran is very much opposed to that. And the main reason that Saudi Arabia wants to make a deal is because they are also afraid of Iran and they have this conflict and they're fighting Iran through various proxy wars. Saudi Arabia is fighting Iran, you know, like in Yemen and in other places. So Saudi Arabia is actually <laughs> wants to join the Israel the US camp against Iran. And just as this deal, every day we hear more and more how they're closer and closer to a deal. And of course, Iran's going to do whatever they can to stop it by using their proxies, their Hamas and Hezbollah, which is all fully funded, subsidized, armed by Iran, as we all know. So it's not a coincidence that this happens now because they're trying to stop this deal and it ties right back into this prophecy in the Mid Midrash that is going to be specifically the conflict will begin because of a battle, a conflict between Paras and Arav, between Iran and between two parts of Ishmael, between two houses within Ishmael. These are both Muslim countries, right? So they're both Ishmaelim. And within Ishmael, you have these two, two forces that clash, but that's going to cause this final war that will bring Mashiach. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai Rashbi in a few places, he says very something really interesting. He says, for example, in Shira Shirim Rabbah, in the Midrash, he says like this, Tanei Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. He taught, Im ra'it sus parsi, if you see a Persian horse, an Iranian horse, sus parsi, kashur bekivrei Eretz Yisrael, tied to the graves of Israel. Tzapel raglav shel Mashiach. You should expect Mashiach to come very shortly. That's something that Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai the teacher of the Zohar, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, taught this already 2,000 years ago. When you see the Persian horses, the Persian weapons, the Persian armaments causing graves in Israel, you should know that Mashiach is on his way. And this is Iran. This is the Persian horse, right? Who's Hamas? Hamas is just an arm of Iran. And they get all their weapons. This is all sus palsy. That's what we're seeing here. And when you look at how, how will this war begin? The Midrash says in Pirkei Rabbi Eliezer, it's actually a fa famous Midrash that Ishmael is actually not just going to start one war. The war will start on three fronts. 
in Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, it says, Be'od Rabbi Ishmael Omer, Shlosha milchamot shel mehuma atidin bnei Ishmael asot ba'aretz ba'acharit ayamim. In the end of days, the Ishmaelim, the bnei Ishmael, will cause three wars, okay, on three fronts. How do we know? Shenemar ki pnei, there's a verse in Isaiah, mi pnei charavot nadadu, and it says, achat ba'yar, one of these wars will be in the wilderness, in a forest, ba'arav, and another one, ba'achat ba'yam, and another one in the sea, ba'achat bikrach gadol, and one in a big city. So three, on three fronts, they're going to instigate the war. Okay, so one in the wilderness, one in the sea, and one in a city. That's how it starts. That's what it says. Now, the way this is typically interpreted and read is that the war, achat bayar ba'arav, means that the war will actually, the, the war on land will take place in Arabia, and then one at sea somewhere. And Bikach Gadol is a city in the west, somewhere in Edom. Because the way the passage continues, it implies that it's going to happen in Edom, which we always associate as the Western world, the Christian world, Edom. But you can actually read this pasuk as saying all three of these things will happen in the Holy Land. When it says Ba'aretz, really it's, it's, you can read as if it's implying Ba'aretz Israel in the Holy Land that all these three things will happen because it could mean the wilderness could just mean Ba'arav could just mean the, a wilderness in the West. And Krach Gadol just means a big city. And Edom, remember, was originally in Israel. Like the original land of Edom was in Israel. It's the land of Esav. That's where Esav lived in the south of Israel. So you can actually read this passage, uh, not like the way it's been classically interpreted, but you can just read it shut straight up the way it's written as this is going to happen on three fronts, in the wilderness in the west of Israel, in the city in the south of Israel, and on sea. And if we look at how this attack began, that's precisely how it began, right? There was this horrible massacre in this nature party, in this Mesibat Teva, in near Gaza, you know, in the west of, southwest of Israel. So one of these, the, the, the worst of the massacres took place in the wilderness, quite literally. And if you've seen some of the eyewitness accounts and, and the horrific stories, people were hiding in the woods and in trees and in bushes for hours and hours and hours. So there was one attack in the wilderness and one from the sea. There were Hamas terrorists coming across from the Mediterranean. And, and there was, of course, in the city, they took, basically took over Sderot and, and did terrible deeds and things over there. So we actually, we can see this passage, this ancient prophecy realized in, in exactly how this war began, you know, in the wilderness, at sea, and in a big city, or in a city in the south of Israel. Interestingly, the pasuk that it quotes from Isaiah that I mentioned it actually says, Ki, Mipnei charavot nadadu. It uses the word and it says, What is charavot? Ein charavot ala milchamot. So it uses, it's an interpretation of this passage in Isaiah. The Midrash is telling us what is the deeper secret of, the, of this verse in Isaiah that says, Mipnei charavot. They, they, they came away from the swords. It's interesting if you looked at what the IDF has called their mission now in response to this. The, the response mission is called Operation. Iron swords, Mifza Haravot Barzel. So it's just interesting that they use the same word of, of Haravot. That's that exactly, that's the word that Chazal was actually interpreting. They're saying Haravot means Ein Haravot Ela Milchamot. So the verse in Isaiah from which they extract, our sages extracted the secret, the prophecy here about the war at the end of days, it's based on this word Haravot. And interestingly enough, the IDF called the current war, Mifza Haravot Barzel, the war of iron, campaign of iron swords, Operation Iron Swords. So we don't know if this, if this is the war. Obviously, nobody knows if this is it. We, if it seems like what's happening in Israel very much matches what these prophecies are saying in the Zohar, in the Midrash, about Ishmael, about the location, about the way this will happen, about the, the terrible tragedies. So we don't know if this is the one, but we hope it is. So let's hope that this is the final war and that there won't be any more. Let's hope that this is the war to end all wars and that we will see, Bezrat Hashem, the coming of Mashiach this year, like the Midrash says, you know, B'Shanash HaMelech HaMashiach, in the year that Melech HaMashiach will come. So let us hope that this, this is it, that this is the year and there won't be any more wars. In the meantime, what can we do about it? I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back to the, these Midrashim in, at the end. 
uh, in the meantime, what can we do? We all want to help as much as possible. And we all, we're all already, I'm sure all of us are doing whatever we can to help. What else can we do other than the things that we're already doing? We're all praying, of course. And we should continue praying and don't stop praying. We should never think that prayer is ineffective. A prayer is effective. Prayer is scientifically proven to be effective. You have to remember that you know, quantum physics has already proven to us that we live in a very mental universe and that our minds have a very real effect on the world around us, a very measurable effect on the world around us. Your thoughts do have energy. They re- release energy into the world around you. Our thoughts are, are effective. Our prayers are. So your prayers are not just empty words. And every prayer helps. Your kavanot, your intentions, they do help. So don't stop praying. And we, we've all probably already given to charity. And that's also a big thing. You know, King Solomon said, it's In Proverbs, King Solomon said that charity saves from death. You know, if you think about that, the full pasuk there is, Lo yo ilu resha, that the treasures of the wicked won't help them. But, but charity can save a person from death. And in the Torah, we see there was a mitzvah for every person to give a half shekel. And the Torah uses the term that giving the shekel, giving a donation of money, is a kofer nafsho. It's, a, it's an atonement for the soul. Somehow giving money is a way to save souls. What's the connection there? In fact, if you like gematria, if you like numerology, the, the numerical value of shekel, shin is 300 and kuf is 100, and lamed is 30. Shekel is 430. And the gematria of nefesh, nun is 50, and pei is 80, and shin is 300, is also 430. So shekel and nefesh actually have the same numerical value. Because giving a shekel is a way of actually atoning for one soul. It can save souls. Another word for, for money in Hebrew is damim. Damim literally means blood. Because we're, our money is actually tied to our very being. If you think about, again, going back to this idea of energy, that we live in a universe that's all energy, ultimately, right? The whole universe emerged out of one. Both science and Torah agree that the whole universe just came out of one infinite, one, one point, one point of light. And there's just this illusion of, of different things. But ultimately, everything is one. And we're all just these beings of energy in a world full of energy. So if you think about it, the way you earn your money is by exerting energy. It's your soul you know, using the body's energy, exerting energy to earn that money. And so when you give some of that money to charity, it's like giving back that energy. You know, it's, you, you used your spiritual energy, even your physical energy and your spiritual energy to earn that money. And then when you give it, it's like giving it away. It's like you're giving away a part of your soul. And that's why our sages say, and King Solomon says, that's the katatzil mimavid, that when you give a portion of your wealth, it's also an atonement for the soul and it can save souls. In addition to, aside from the fact that you are physically helping people with the charity, right, to provide food, to provide whatever it is that they need, water, support, blankets, weapons, uh, bulletproof vests, everything that, that the people in Israel and the, our, our dear soldiers need. But there's also a spiritual effect there of actually causing the, the heavens to, to protect the souls of these people, of our brothers and sisters in Israel. So those that you already know, praying, charity, all that stuff. What can we do aside from that to help spiritual things that we can do? So I want to offer three things. Two of them you probably already know about, and I just want to refine it, expound upon it a little bit and refine it. And the last one you probably maybe don't know about, and it's a little secret from the Arizal. So these things are all, again, spiritual. Um, you know, there's, there's only so much we can do remotely from far away. There's only so much we can do if we're not actually in the heat of the battle and fighting, although there's uh, amazing, brave people who are here in New York, in Toronto. I've heard people organizing flights to fly back to Israel, or veterans and ex-soldiers to go back to Israel and fight. But for the majority of people that can't actually physically fight or necessarily provide support on the ground, there are spiritual things that we can do. And again, remember, these might seem trivial. Like you might think, what does this ritual have to do with a war thousands of miles away? But it's not trivial, because again, the whole universe is interconnected. All of Israel is interconnected. Our sages say, Kol Israel Aravim right? Like we're all guarantors for each other, but literally we're all mixed into each other. Our souls are all linked together. And what a Jew does here affects what happens over there. 
And we're all, all of Bet Israel and the whole house of Israel, what we do all over the world, helps the situation in the land of Israel. So we're all interconnected. We live in this mental universe. Our energy does have an effect. Our thoughts do, do have an effect. Our kavanot, our intentions do have an effect. Every time you have that kind of positive thought, it sends positive energy over there. So these things are very real and very measurable. These are, this is not just some, you know, whatever, mystical, whatever. This is real. This is quite real. So it might seem trivial, but it's actually not. And every little thing that we do helps our brothers and sisters over there. We're all in it because we're all in it together at the end of the day. And, and we have to remember that the Torah tells us over and over again that who really fights for us? We have our soldiers, but ultimately who gives them strength and, and the keys to victory are in God's hands. And so, for example, we read in Tehillim, a very famous verse in Tehillim, chapter 20, Ella barechev ve'ella basusim. You know, these come against us with their chariots, and these come against us with their horses. Ve'anachnu b'shem Hashem Elohim. We come in the name of God, right? Like, this is, a, this is what we need to do. And God is called Netzach Yisrael, right? He is called the victor of Israel. That's one of the titles for God. In Tanakh is Netzach Yisrael, that God is our victory, you know, and through, by connecting to God, by channeling that divine energy, ultimately, uh, we will emerge victorious from, from this. And in, in, throughout the Torah, there are verses that tell us that God fights for us. Hashem ilachem lachem, ve'atem tacharishun, right? Wait, at the splitting of the sea, at the splitting of the sea, the people were worried and they didn't know what to do and some of the people wanted to fight. And Moses told, Moshe told them, Hashem ilachem lachem, God will fight for you, ve'atem tacharishun, you be silent and, and wait for God's, and see God's salvation. So we fight, but we also... There are people fighting on the ground, but it's also God fighting for us on our behalf. And we say it in the Torah and we read it in our prayers. Ki Hashem Elohechem HaOlechi Machem. God is with our soldiers. Leilachem Lachem and fights alongside them. Imo Ebechem Leoshia Etchem. He fights your enemies with you. God is accompanying our soldiers and everybody who's battling the enemy. God is with them. So every time we do something spiritual, every little mitzvah, every prayer, every bit of Torah that we learn actually gives more strength to our fighters over there. And, you know, recently we, we explored the book of Maccabees, for those who were there and you remember. And in the book of Maccabees already, 2,200 some years ago, it says how the Maccabees, there were, as we know, five brothers. Yehuda was the leader, and there was five brothers, and four of them each had a contingent of several thousand soldiers, and one of them, Elazar, he was actually left to have a group of people who studied and prayed. It says that they prayed and they studied the law of God to help the other four brothers spiritually in, in the battle. And the book of Maccabees reports that that's, that was actually helpful and that they caused the angels to come and fight on behalf of the Maccabees and the Greeks would flee in fear from what they saw. So even then already, 2200 years ago, four of the Maccabee brothers fought in battle, and one of the Maccabee brothers made sure that there was a group of people who were praying and learning and making sure that they had the spiritual support. And the Talmud says the same. In Sanhedrin it says, Il male David lo asa yo'av milchama. If it wasn't for King David doing his prayers and his teilim and his Torah study, then Yoav, his main general, would not have been successful in war. Ve il male yo'av, and if it wasn't for Yoav in battle, David then King David would not have been able to learn Torah and do his thing. And so they needed each other. David and Yoav were partners. One was out fighting, and David was spiritually supporting him, you know, and vice versa. And the fact that Yoav was fighting and protecting David, that he could do his thing back home. Although David himself was a great warrior, of course, when he was younger, he was the great warrior of Israel. So there was always throughout Jewish history... There was, there was this partnership between the spiritual and the physical and that what we do spiritually affects what they do over there physically. And so right from this, from the book of Maccabees and from here, we learn that actual Torah study does have an effect and does help us in, in this battle and does help our soldiers in battle. And I just want to refine that that's something you already knew. That's, that's nothing new. But the Arizal actually tells us what we should read. Okay, what we should study. What specifically in the realm of Torah would be helpful to study right now? The Arizal says something really amazing. The Arizal says, like, what parts of the spiritual worlds do different aspects of Torah connect to? So he, he says, 
that learning Kabbalah corresponds to a particular realm in the higher world of Atzilut, the highest of the, of the, the, the dimensions, spiritual dimensions. That Talmud Bebriya and learning Talmud Gemara is in the, the next world called Briya. Ve'a Mishnah ve'a Midrashim ve'a Gadot be'yetzira and learning Mishnah and Midrash and these things is in the world called Yetzira which is the realm above us. Ve'a Mikra be'asiya and studying Mikra, studying scripture, studying Tanakh is here, corresponds to this world that we are in, the physical world, Olam Ha'asiya. So if you want to rectify higher spiritual worlds you can study kabbalah you can study talmud you can study mishnah midrash but if you want to have an effect on this world down here in olam asiya the most powerful thing the most potent thing you can do is actually study mikra scripture scripture has the greatest effect on this physical world olam asiya and specifically what part of scripture he says that Hanavim, the books of the prophets, and Benetzach Vehod, the Dhura, that they correspond to the Sfirot of Netzach and Hod. And again, Netzach is victory. Literally, Netzach means victory. And that's the source of our strength and our victory. So it's the Nevi'im, studying Nevi'im, the books of the Nevi'im and Tanakh, is the most potent thing you can do to strengthen Israel and to assure the victory of Israel. That's what the Arizal says. And he says, Aktuvim, the last portion of Tanakh, the books of Ktuvim, they are in the Yisod. They are in what's the Sphira, sphira of Yisod. And uh, many of you know that the time of Mashiach, it's called the main Tikkun, the main rectification, is actually Tikkun Yisod or Tikkun Abrit that has to do with all things with basically sexual immorality and immorality and licentiousness and things like that. Our sages already said long ago that the, the, the main cause of immorality in, in the end of days before Mashiach comes will be all things to do with sexual things, which we see in the world around us, right? That the world has gone very crazy in this, in this realm. In the realm of Yisod, all things to do with sexuality will be upside down. And that'll be the final tikkun. So studying Ketuvim, the Arizal says, specifically corresponds to Yisod. And studying Nevi'im corresponds to Netzach Vehod. So this is the part that is actually going to help us now. And the Arizal says that those two in particular channel more male energies, more masculine energies, more strength. Whereas the other studies, Kabbalah and the Talmud and Mishnah, they're more feminine. They're more in the realm of Nukva. So if we want to strengthen Israel and tap into that kind of energy, we should be actually studying Nach, the Nevi'im and the Ketuvim is the most important thing to study in, in this particular situation, to, talk, to connect to that part called Netzach. Okay, so keep that in mind. So, so one thing you can do is, so, you know, Nach is something that's often neglected today. We all read Chumash regularly. You, you know, you go to shul every week, you cover the whole Chumash, the five books of Moses every year. We read some Aftarot, but then, you know, most of Nach kind of gets often gets neglected. So one thing you can do, if you haven't already, it's great to do anyways. Every Jew should have read the Tanakh at least once in their life from start to finish, Nach in particular. So if you haven't done that, now's the, the best time to start because again, studying Nach is what's really going to help spiritually in this conflict. And that's of course what they studied. What did the Maccabees study? Back then they didn't have Talmud and Kabbalah, not in a revealed way. They didn't have the books. They had the knowledge, but they didn't have the books. So what they were studying, when the book of Maccabees says they were studying scripture, they were studying Tanakh. That's what they had. You know, when King David was studying on behalf of Yoav, what was he studying? He was studying Tanakh. That's what he had. So that's what we need to be studying the most right now and to take upon ourselves to learn Nach as much as possible. And yesterday, we actually on Simchat Torah, the, the Haftarah is the first chapter of, of Nach, of Yoshua, Sefer Yoshua, chapter one. So if you already started yesterday, it's a great time to just continue from Yoshua, chapter one. And go all the way to the end and learn Nach, because that's going to tap into the exact place, the exact source in the heavens for the kind of energy we need right now, the Netzach energy and the Yisod energy, studying Nach. And it's just, it's worth reading what we read yesterday, what Yoshua says, because it's so relevant to us right now, right? Yoshua repeats over and over again, Chazak ve'ematz, just be strong and be brave. Ki you you will subdue the people that live in this land you will inherit you will settle this land that god says i gave you i promise to you all you need to do is rak chazak ve'ematz me'od right be brave be strong and then he says exactly what we're saying here lishmor la'asot kechol 
התורה אשר ציווך משה עבדי, זה make sure that you, you know, fulfill the Torah, and more than that, לא ימוש ספר התורה הזה מפיך, והגית בו יומם ולילה. Now you should meditate upon words of Torah, upon scripture day and night. And they should always be on your mouth. We should always have verses of, Nah, of Tanakh in particular. in our mouths, you know, and that's the source of our strength. That's where our chazak, chizuk comes from at the end of the day. So that's one thing of, of learning of Torah. If you haven't already done this, take upon yourselves. And I see already, I've, I've been invited to so many Torah learning groups. It's fantastic. You know, people are doing at my school as well. A collective, let's finish all Mishnahs. Let's finish all Nach let's, or Tanakh. Let's finish all Psalms. So be a part of that. And that's something very powerful. Another thing to do, more specifically than that, we know also Tehilim, of course, is super powerful to do. And that's part of, part of Tanakh, right? Tehilim is part of Tanakh. And, and Midrash Tehilim says something very interesting. Midrash Tehilim actually says, when King David said, you know, may my words be good to you, whatever, acceptable to you. What did he mean? Midrash Tehilim says, King David said, let my words, let my psalms be for generations, something special. It'll be unique in Tanakh, that people shouldn't read Tehilim like they read other books, that when King David made this agreement with God, and he said that when people are going to read Tehilim, it's as if they're going to be studying the most difficult aspects of Jewish law, the most difficult Talmudic tractates, like Negaim and Nohalot. So Tehilim actually has incredible merit, incredible power, And tremendous secrets and so that's also of course a part of of Nach so if you haven't covered all of Tehilim people have been asking you which Tehilim to read and my answer to everyone was all of them and I just started the beginning and read the whole thing read all the Tehilim and you'll see some amazing things that actually connect to what's happening now you know as soon as I heard this new Saturday afternoon I started reading Tehilim and I finished the whole thing and um, Also my son, who's seven years old, also took upon himself to read all of Tehilim. So if he can do it, you all can do it. And so everybody should read like all of Tehilim. And one of the amazing things that stood out to me is Psalm number 83. Because again, it's just describing exactly what we're seeing today around us. It begins by saying, Elohim al milach, don't be silent, al techaresh. You know, don't be still, don't be silent, because what's happening, that your enemies are proudly doing these horrible things. They planned, they conspired against your nation. And they conspired and did all these horrible things against your hidden ones, your little ones. Let's wipe them out. Let's wipe Israel off the map, which is, they love to say these things, Iran and Hamas, right? Let's wipe them off the map. And this is what King David is saying thousands of years ago. They all came together against you. And who are these people that came together against you? Edom. Edom is first. Ve'ishma'elim, as we've already seen. Moab. Moab is what's today Jordan. that region. The Hagrim Gaval is in, the, is in the north, like close to Syria. The Ammon. Ammon is also Jordan. The capital of Jordan is Amman. That's the ancient, comes from Ammon. The Amalek and Peleshet, of course, the Pelishtim, the precursor of the, of the, the spiritual forefathers of the, of the Palestinians, the, the current Pelishtim. They all came together in Yoshvei Tzor, with Tzor. What's Tzor? Tzor is Tyre. Tyre is Lebanon, right? What's today Lebanon? So these are the, 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 the players that we see today, the Ishmaelim, you know, you got Jordan, you got Syria, Gam Ashur, it says, and Assyria, and uh, Amalek, and the Plishtim, and all these people are coming together. Esther just asked about if it's okay, if it's also effective to read Tehilim in English. Yes, it is. And ideally you read it in Hebrew because there's, of course, uh, mystical power to the Hebrew language. But even in English, I'd read both. Right? If, it, if it's hard to go get through the Hebrew, read the Hebrew and then also read the translation. Uh, it's very worthwhile to do both. Right? Read the Hebrew and also understand what it's saying because it's very powerful words. So here in this psalm, it's actually describing the situation we have today. This group of people that conspired against us to commit all these horrible crimes. Horrible crimes. Like, how can human beings even do such things? 
supposedly human beings. Unbelievable. So that's what it's saying here in Tehillim. Uh, King David is saying, don't let this happen, Hashem. Don't be still. You know, show us your hand here. And note how it says Adom too, right? Adom, who, who enabled what's happening here? Right? We shouldn't forget that Adom is involved too. If you've seen the Western media, I've been looking at like, what, what is the Western media saying? And it's the same old headlines trying to paint Israel as the enemy. And uh, let's not forget that there is an aspect of Adom here, of the Western world abetting these crimes. And it's also not a coincidence that not only, as we said, Iran is trying to block this, stop the Saudi Arabia-Israel deal. But don't forget also that Iran just got several billion dollars in recent weeks because the Biden administration decided to you know, free, unfreeze some of their accounts and allow billions of dollars to Iran. And it's not a coincidence that this happens right after. Or where do you think that money? They're saying, no, don't worry, it all went to humanitarian causes only. That's nonsense. And they're going to use that money for the same terrorist activity. So it's not a coincidence here, and their Edom is helping them in this ultimately. So that's what King David is saying, that it's all together when, when, when the Midrash and the Zohar and our sages say it's going to be a global thing. It's a global phenomenon. It's very much so. It's Edom and it's Ishmael and it's everybody else, right? And Amalek and Peleshet and Ashur and everybody. And King David ultimately says, you know, do to them what you did. Do to them what you did to Sisra. If you remember, Sisra was this evil, this villain 3,000 years ago that Dvorah, Deborah defeated. Deborah and Barak, Dvorah and Barak, the judges defeated. So do to them what you did. Do to the current oppressors what you did to them. And it keeps saying, it gives more. I'm just going to skip ahead. And ultimately it ends by saying, And then they'll know, you know, who is God. Now these people are going and reciting Allahu Akbar as if they're doing this for God. You know, these people are, are couldn't be further from God. So King David is saying, show them what God really means. This is just one of the Psalms, Psalm number 83. But so many of the Tehillim, describe what we're going through right now. So it helps even not just the spiritual kind of theurgic power of Tehillim, but just in general also to understand what's happening. A lot of the prophecies are in Tehillim. Okay, so that's point number one. The importance of learning Tanakh in particular right now is something that we can all do to take upon ourselves to learn Nach in particular. You know, there's 929 chapters in the whole Tanakh. Of those, 187 are in the Chumash, which we've all you know read many times, and that leaves 742 chapters of Nach. There's 700 specifically, 742 chapters of Nach, and that number is actually really significant in, in, in Kabbalah in general. Has very great mystical significance, 742, and one of those significances is that we we read this verse in Dvarim every time we take out the Torah, and before the Torah reading begins, we say Vatem Advekim Be'Hashem Eloechem, and you. Connect to God. You cleave on, you glue onto God. Dvekim. You connect to God. Chaim kulchem ayom. And that's what brings us life when we connect to God. So the value actually of Atema Dvekim Be'ashem Eloechem, the value of that, those words is 742. That if you want to cleave to God, cleave to His Word, right? Read the Word of God. Study the Word of God, which is the Nach. And that's how you cleave to Hashem and Chaim kulchem ayom. And that's how you will live. So that's actually just something small about 742. There's a, a, a really powerful kind of numerological connection there. So that's Tanakh and Tehillim. Okay, take it upon yourselves. Finish all of Tehillim. F- try to read the whole Nach. You know, start from Yoshua and continue all the way to the end. A couple of ch- If you do three chapters a day, you do the whole thing in a year. You know, three chapters a day from the beginning, actually, because there's 929 chapters from total from the Torah, starting from the Torah of Moses. So if you do the whole Tanakh cover to cover, if you do three chapters a day, you finish the whole thing in a year. That was number one. The second one I want to just mention very quickly because many people know about this already, which is for, for men to put on tefillin, because, you know, the Lubavitcher Rebbe in 1967, right before the Six Day War, he started this whole tefillin campaign, right? We've all seen Lubavitchers on the street corners and subway stations and whatever, putting on tefillin uh, on people or, you know, offering to put on tefillin. 
And that started in 1967 when there were whispers of war and the Rebbe said, okay, we have to, the Lubavitch Rebbe said, we have to strengthen Israel, strengthen our soldiers. And one of the ways we can do that spiritually is tefillin. And he started this tefillin campaign and it worked really well in 1967, as we know. So tefillin is something very, really powerful. And we know that because it actually says in Tehillim, sorry, in the Talmud, there's a verse in, in the Torah in Dvarim that says, V'ra'u kol ha'aretz ki shem Hashem nikra alecha v'yira'u mimeka, that the nations of the world will see that God's name is upon you and they will fear you. And the Talmud says, V'tanya Rabbi Eliezer HaGadol Omer, Rabbi Eliezer taught, what does this mean, the name of God is upon you? Elu tefillin sheberosh, that's the head tefillin. That's when we put, you know, God's name quite literally upon us. So when the tefillin has this power to drive away our enemies. And partly based on this and, and other sources, but mainly based on this, the Lubavitcher Rebbe instituted the tefillin campaign. So that's just a quick one that people can do. If you're not putting on tefillin regularly, put it on regularly. Uh, if you know people that aren't putting on tefillin, inspire them to put on tefillin. If you don't have tefillin, let me know and I can help you get some tefillin. But uh, we, we should just strengthen the midst of tefillin because this is like our, a spiritual weapon for us. Okay, so tefillin is another thing we can do to help the situation over there spiritually. And the last one I'm going to tell you is probably the least known one. And it might, again, seem very trivial, but it's extremely powerful. Okay, the last one is actually my Mahalonim. Okay, you, you know my Mahalonim? This little ritual that we do after we eat, after you have a meal, before Birkat Amazon, you're supposed to wash your hands. Okay, and you wash in a vessel, you take a little vessel, you might have seen these in the stores, the little Maim Mahalonim vessels, and you put your fingers together and you wash, and halachically you're supposed to wash up to the second knuckle with some water, and then spill away that water, take it away. So that's called Maim Mahalonim. You do it before Birkat Amazon, before the grace after meals, after you had a meal. So, and you might think, well, what's, what does this have to do with anything? What does my Mahalonim have to do with anything? So the Mishnah says in Eruvin, it says, Arbad Varim, there's four things that soldiers, Jewish soldiers in the camp are exempt from. Okay? And one of them is, it doesn't matter what the other three are, one is about bringing uh, lumber, and one is about Damai, which has to do with tithing, so, and from Eruv. But the, the last one that they're exempt from, it says, that soldiers, Jewish soldiers at war, are exempt from the mitzvah of, of, of washing their hands. And the Talmud asks, what does that mean that they're exempt from washing their hands? What does that mean? What, are, what, what the meaning here is, the sages exempted a soldier from not having to wash not doing netilat yadayim, right? You know, the, the, the washing before you eat bread, before you make the blessing on bread. But, but washing my Mahalonim after the meal, that was always obligatory. Even soldiers at war are not exempt from this. So right away there's a connection between war and soldiers and my Mahalonim. And our sages are making a connection. They're saying even soldiers at war must do my Mahalonim. Because there's something important there. Something that can save their life. Okay, I'm not going to go into it. We really don't have that much time to go into it in depth. But in short... My Mahalonim is actually something very powerful, and the Zohar says that this is able to drive away the Sitra Acha, okay? Evil spirits, all the side of the Sitra Acha, is the, the realm of evil, where all this kind of evil that we're seeing in Israel today, all, where is that all coming from? All of that evil is coming from the Sitra Acha, okay? The spiritual domain of impurity and all these demonic forces. So to drive that away, My Mahalonim actually accomplishes that. It drives away the Sitra Acha. And the Arizal goes into great depth about all the Kavanot of my Mahalonim and what exactly they do and what the connection is. And ultimately, the, the Arizal actually says that my Mahalonim is connected to the final redemption. It's connected to the name of God called Eheye Asher Eheye. You know that name of God when Moses came, before Moses came to Egypt, when he spoke to God on Mount Sinai, he says, what is your name? How will I introduce you to the people when I come to them in Egypt? And God says, I am Ehiyeh Asher Ehiyeh, right? I am, uh, however you want to translate it. I am what I am, or I will be what I will be. And our sages say, what does that mean, Ehiyeh Asher Ehiyeh? That name doesn't appear anywhere else. It's unique. It only appears there in the whole Torah. And our sages say, Ehiyeh Asher Ehiyeh means I will be with you in this redemption with Moses 
uh, and in the final redemption with Mashiach. So just as I'm with you now, I will be with you then. So the Arizal gives many kavanot of how this particular practice of my Mahonim taps into that energy of of bringing God the, the final redemption, to bring about, to speed up the final redemption. And he gives various kavanot of how it's connected, and I'm not going to go into it because it's a bit long, but about how the actual bringing the fingers together with the thumb how it actually represents this number 41, which is a milui of Ehiyah, and there's all these interesting kavanot. If you're interested, I can share it with you. I wrote a whole book about it. You don't have to read the book. Just uh, I give it to you in short, that my Mahalanim actually has a really powerful kavana to bring about the final redemption. Okay, That's what it's connected to, and the Arizal spends a lot of time talking about it. So it seems really simple. It seems really trivial. What does this have to do with anything? Before Birkat Tamazon, just to wash wash your, your hands with the vessel, but it's actually extremely powerful. And the Arizal says it can help to bring about the final redemption, which is what we want and what we are waiting for. And so something small you can do before you bench, before you do Birkat Amazon, do my Mahalonim. And this is, by the way, for both men and women. A lot of women think that it doesn't apply to them, that they're exempt. That's not true. All the Puskim say that women are also obligated in my Mahalonim. And you know, in ancient times, they even had a bracha for it. Our sages did institute a bracha. From, just like there's a bracha for netilat yadayim, when you say, there used to be a bracha for this, where they would say, anybody know what they would say? The bracha for my machalonim was, but we don't say a bracha today, halachically. And there's a reason for that. The Rambam explains that because there's a danger involved, because it, it deals with something negative, it's driving away the sitra acha. The Rambam didn't say sitra acha, but he said because there's a danger involved, uh, we don't make a bracha when there's a danger involved. That said, you know, my mahalonim channels that energy of the final redemption, helps to bring about the final redemption, which is what we're waiting for. And so I just want to finish with, go back to the first verse that I quoted in Tehillim chapter 20, which says, and if you read the full context of that verse, the previous verse says, you know, King David says, now I know that God will save his Mashiach. And then it says, all these people are coming to attack us with their chariots and, and horses and all their weapons, but God will save us and God will bring about Mashiach. And in the Yalkut Shimoni, which I quoted before, chapter 499, and just to finish with this, to give a little glimmer of hope in this, in this terrible situation. It says, like we said, like we started with, these birth pangs will be very difficult. The Jewish people are shaking and are just confounded. How is this possible? And they're going to say, Like, where do we go from here? How can we, how can we overcome this? This is just such a horrible... Like, where do we go from here? And God comes and says, Don't worry. Don't be scared. Everything that I did, ultimately, I did it for you. You know, it's hard for us to see that now, but ultimately, God is in, in control. Why are you scared? Don't worry, because the time of your redemption has arrived. And the final redemption is not like the first redemption. You know, the first time God redeemed us out of Egypt, there were still all these horrible catastrophes that happened to us throughout history since then, over the last three and a half thousand years. After this final redemption, there will be no more suffering. This is the last, the last bit of suffering. It's the worst because it's the last. And finally, it says, Shanu Rabbuteinu, our sages taught, B'Sha'a Melcha Mashiach Ba, when Mashiach will come, Omed al Gag Beit HaMikdash, he's going to stand on the roof of the temple. And you're going to say, well, where's the temple? We don't have a temple yet. So you can either interpret it to say he'll stand on the temple mount, or, you know, we have a tradition that the third temple won't require to be built. You know, there's a, a long tradition in, in Judaism that the third temple will actually descend fully built from heaven. You know, like a spaceship, right where it needs to go. We'll just have to connect the plumbing and the electrical, but everything else will come right from right from space. So there is such a tradition. So Melech HaMashiach will stand al Gag Beit HaMikdash, ve'u mashmi'a le'em le'Israel ve'omer, and he's going to tell all of Israel, Anavim, O oh, you humble ones, higi azman Okay, 
okay, the time for your redemption has arrived. Just look at the light that's coming down here. Because it says in Isaiah, God's light, that initial light of creation. This whole passage in the, in the Midrash here in Yalkut Shimoni is talking about the initial light of creation, the light of the first day of creation. What happened to that light? It says God hid that light away for the tzaddikim in the world to come. And finally, that light will return. The primordial light, the O Haganuz, the divine light of creation, will return and will shine upon all of us. On you specifically. It'll shine upon you and not on all these idolaters and wicked people around you. Because it's the, the verse in Isaiah continues that they will have darkness and we will have light. And so then we will all glow together with Mashiach and all of us, we will glow with the divine light of creation. And all the nations of the world will come and walk in our light because the verse continues in Isaiah and says, So then, all the nations of the world will, will walk in our light and we will shine with the light of creation. May we see that day very soon. And um, if you take anything out of today, just that there is, you know, these things are horrible, but we should try to not to see the negative stuff, try to focus on the positive things, do whatever we can to help spiritually. If we can help physically, that's even better. If we can provide food, support, whatever, supplies, money, it's great and give the emotional support for the people that are there and look after each other and stop the divisions among us. People are still arguing. There's no need to argue. There's no need to fight. There's too much of that already, right? We need to focus on the avat chinam. There's no need to place blame and we don't need to share negative messages. It happened because, you know, we weren't righteous enough. We're never righteous enough, right? There's always, we're never righteous enough for somebody. So we don't have to share those negative messages. We need to just focus on Staying together, staying positive, doing whatever we can to help. And God willing, we will see the end of this soon. We will see the end of this. And hopefully this really is the final war. Nobody knows for sure, but God willing, the signs are there. Hopefully this is Gogu Magog. This is the war to end all wars. And we won't have to deal with such things again. And we'll see Mashiach soon. And the light will return upon us. And we'll finally have the air of peace and prosperity and godliness that we're all looking forward to. And we'll end with that.